Uh, Sami, you have your mic on mute. Thank you, Brother Irungu, and welcome everyone to this uh, session. I really want to thank the Lord. We have been traveling a journey on the series of uh, justification by faith. And uh, I, I thank the Lord that uh, uh, so far we have been just able to uncover a few things to do with the history of justification by faith. And uh, uh, I'd like to bring this message to a close with closing remarks. I can't say that uh, we have exhausted everything, as I said during the, uh, uh, the midday presentation, but all I can say we have laid an enough foundation that people can build on based on the Bible and based on the truth in inspiration. And so this will just be closing remarks. I know that the Lord loves his children and he will guide them into all truth. They will be able to just get enough information that uh, will help them be able to stand during the uh, investigative judgment. I want to say this as uh, we want to go into a presentation that uh, looking around the world, we see that uh, all the prophecies that uh, have been predicted in the book of Daniel, Revelation and Synoptic Gospels actually have re reached their climax. And uh, as we end this series on justification by faith, I'll, I'll be trying to cover some prophetic events and uh, some prophetic information uh, uh, starting from uh, next Sabbath, if God, be, uh, if God willing, we, we will try to run through the prophecies that are happening uh, uh, that the Lord has predicted they will be able to happen and see where we are in the history of the time. As a matter of fact, uh, for the past uh, two months, I have been studying about uh, the financial uh, system of the world and uh, where we are headed. And uh, I'll be able to present on it, God willing, so that uh, we may understand what is actually going to happen in the near future. And the Lord is trying to prepare his people so that they may not be caught unaware. We are told that we are not the children of darkness, that the day should get us un unaware. And uh, apart from the financial things, uh, plans that are being put in place and uh, the fires that we are seeing and all this stuff going on, uh, there's one prophecy, one more important prophecy that has not happened and the Lord is waiting for it to happen. That is the, the complete uh, uh, revelation of his character in his church, the manifestation of himself in his church, which will be called the loud cry, the angel of Revelation chapter 18, when the whole world will be filled with the glory of God. That is the most important and significant prophecy that has not happened. And the Lord is preparing his people. And very soon you will see the glory of God all over the face of the earth. I don't want you to miss it. Don't wake up on the side of the foolish virgins. Please wake up on the side of wise virgins and the procession that is to uh, possess the kingdom, which is of Christ and our God. And so uh, prepare your hearts, prepare yourself, prepare your families, Prepare your neighbors and prepare everyone that you can prepare. Everyone that you know of that you can prepare. Do everything you can. Supply materials. This is the time. And I, I want to tell you a secret. I'll pray in a short way. Where we are headed, we are not going to have a lot of things. We are not going to buy and sell. Those who are going to the country, this is the right time to buy those solar panels. Those who have printers, this is the best time to stock your, uh, your printing papers so as to supply those material. If there is anything you can get right now which is not perishable and it will be hard to buy at the time of the crisis, which is near, 2021 is not even going to be a good year. I'm not a prophet, but from reading just the Bible and inspiration, you can get that. It says that things will not get better as this pandemic starts happening and uh, this planned uh, 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 hostilities continue to go Black Lives Matter. And then you see what is happening, tornadoes, fires, lockdowns, and all these things. 
some people think that things will get better, but things are going to get worse. And now it will come to a point of no buying and selling. I wanna tell you right now, as you hear the voice of my, the sound of my voice, if there is anything you can buy, which is not perishable, this is the time to do it. If it is your off-grid power, if it is anything that you can do, your printing press, if you can establish it right now. We've by the lost solar you. Power, everything. Yes, Sister Florence. And so I'm saying, whatever thing that you can do, do it now. And so I want, I want to pray and then go to the presentation, the closing remarks in uh, Righteousness by Faith. Uh, I have covered a lot. If you have missed it, go on my timeline. We shall be uploading them on YouTube so that they may be in one place. Otherwise, let us pray as we start this presentation. Heavenly Father, praise, honor, and glory be unto thy name, thou that loves us with an everlasting love. And so I do pray that uh, whatever preparations that we have to make at this moment, Lord, give us the strength to uh, implement these things, Lord. Increase our faith and give us an appetite of your holiness. Disconnect us from everything in this world that will not help us, Lord, form a character that is fit for the kingdom. And even in the offices that you have placed us in, in every place that uh, we walk and meet the people, Help us be of a positive influence on the side of the kingdom of Christ and not on the side of the kingdom of Satan. And Lord, I pray that you may fill our hearts with the spirit, that this sweet spirit may produce a character in us that will stand the test of the time. And so bless us as we go through these closing remarks in Christ Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Uh, for... Uh, those who haven't followed the sessions, I just welcome you once again. Uh, I hope you will not miss much. We have looked at the history of Minneapolis 1888 and the aftermath. We have looked at the nature of Jesus Christ. We have looked at uh, the definition of sin. We have looked at how Jesus was tempted. And now we looked in the at the lunchtime how he overcame. And now these are the closing remarks, the warning and the promise. This is the part I love the most because in the warning and in the promise. It is not about scaring people, but it is about bringing them into realities of what will happen. People, people have watched a lot of fictitious stories until they, 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 are not, uh, they have not come into realization of the reality before us. But there are realities before us that will bring us into a crisis. And let us not flatter each other that uh, it will be easier. No, nothing will be easier. But those who are hid in Christ, although they go through a crisis, they'll have this peace in their hearts. John chapter 14, verse 27. Peace I leave with you, my own peace, not as the world giveth, but my own peace I give unto you. They'll have this peace amidst the crisis that will be able to stand the test of the time. This is what we need, and we can only possess this peace if we have the character of Christ. We saw that uh, when he passed through troubles, the only way he could overcome was to remain calm and self-possessed. This is something that we miss a lot of the time in our lives. When we are brought in a crisis, when we are in a storm, remember one time when uh, Christ was in a boat and there was a storm. And I have talked about this story uh, some time uh, before, that uh, Christ was sleeping. This is something that uh, marveled the disciples. How could Jesus Christ of all the people be sleeping when there is a storm? Did he know that they were going to sink? And then the disciple came unto him, Master, we perish. The master, the tempest is raging. And he, 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 he woke up and rebuked the storm. Why? He depended on the Father for everything. And so when in a crisis, we will not look at our own dependence, but we will continue beholding the Father. And in that crisis, we shall be able to overcome just as he overcame. And so, yet Satan was not, the, not then destroyed. Amidst all these things, we are looking at the closing remarks, warning and the promises. Amidst all this temptation and the rebellion that uh, Satan had upon the kingdom of God, he was given time to repent. He has been given 6,000 years on earth. 
but he has not been destroyed. That is how God is loving. He has allowed this great controversy to continue so that everyone may examine everything and come to a position to make an informed decision. We don't have to be puppets in the kingdom of God. God is calling us in Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18, come let us reason, not only on the issue, on the issue of Satan and his rebellion, how are this story going to end? And after reasoning, you choose whom you will yield to. The angels did not even then understand all that was involved in the great controversy. The principles at stake were to be more fully revealed. And for the sake of man, Satan's existence must be continued. Desire of Ages 761. Man, as well as angels, must see the contrast between the prince of light and the prince of darkness. He must choose whom he will serve. And so that is why uh, when, when man is created, man is created with the, the highest gift that man could be bestowed with is the freedom of choice. This is the greatest gift that God has ever given to man, the gift of freedom of choice. And man has to reason out with God. Man has to invest God, investigate God and investigate Satan and be able to choose to whom he will yield to. And so as we go to heaven, we are not going as puppets just to be told, do this and we do it. Do not do that and we do not do that. No. Our cases have to be made here on earth and everyone has been given an humble opportunity to look into the great controversy and decide for themselves what is fit for them. And so the final judgment, as even Brother Brown continues to cover it, it will be based on the choices of the people. There will be no doubts in heaven to why this has been made so and this has been made so. And so uh, this is just representation. The Lord has sent to our world a message of warning. Even the third angel's message, all heaven is waiting to hear us vindicate God's law, declaring it to be holy, just, and good. And so the issues at stake in the whole great uh, controversy is the third angel's message. And you understand the third angel's message is... Uh, justification by faith in verity or righteousness by faith. And what does the third angel's message say? If anyone receives the mark of the beast, him will he be uh, commended. He will receive the cup of gold, which is poured out in indignation without a mixture of mercy. And then uh, uh, we are told that uh, on the side of the saints, this is justification by faith. Why? Because when the third angel's message starts sounding, people will try to do some things to please God. And that is what is called righteousness by works. And so in opposition to this, God has a people who believed or who believes on Jesus Christ, who have the faith of Jesus Christ, and they will not yield to the mark and the image of the beast so that they may survive temporarily. But they will rather accept suffering at that time and cling on to God to supply every need and want that they have so that they may go through the crisis. And so the third angel's message, it is a great controversy between righteousness uh, by works and righteousness by faith. Who will be able to, uh, who, will, uh, who will be patient enough to wait upon the Lord? who will be patient enough to await the second coming of Jesus Christ while the seven plagues are being poured out. Who is patient enough? And here we are told that here is the patience of the saints. How does that patience comes about? The book of John chapter 16, 33, that in this world, you will have many troubles, but be of good cheer because I have overcome. So they have, Christ has overcome and then he has given us the same, same victory. So that during the crisis of the third angel's message, we cling on him by faith, even though we do not see through the portholes of or the portals of death. But at that time, we can trust God as even Christ, when he was going to be crucified, did not see through the portals of death and resurrection, but he trusted in the word of the Father. If you remain faithful, I'll save you from the hour of temptation. And yes. Christ did not remain in the grave forever, but he was resurrected because he conquered sin. And by faith in his father, he was resurrected by the life that was in himself. Also, 
we, we are possessors of eternal life. We have been sealed by the spirit of God, according to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 10 to 13. And if we remain faithful, whoever is born of God, this is the victory. Whoever is born of God does not continue to sin, but he keepeth himself pure and spotless from sin. We will be able to go through the crisis. We will have the patience of the saints. Then we will come out uh, uh, eventual victors. And then even though the crisis will be too much, but God will save us from the crisis. The present tribulation cannot be compared to the future glory which shall be revealed when Christ comes with his angels in the glory of the Father. And so are there those uh, here who have been sinning and repenting, sinning and repenting, and will they continue to do so till Christ shall come? No, brothers and sisters, may God help us that we may be truly united to Christ, the living vine and bear fruits the glory of God. We must be truly converted and then bear fruit to the glory of the Father. In John chapter 15, we are told that uh, um, the vine and the father is the husband man and you are the branches. Remain in me and I in you and then you will bear much fruit. That is the words of Jesus Christ. And then in the book of uh, First John, let us go to the book of First John. Chapter 5, verses 18. First of all, I'll read First John chapter 5, verse 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. So nothing will overcome this world, not our works. No, our works will not overcome this world. The faith in Jesus Christ, who is able to do exceedingly much more than we can ask of, will overcome the world. Who is that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? First John chapter 5, verse 5. And then going to verse 18, we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one touches him not. And so the Lord is able to preserve those who come unto him so that they may remain spotless in this world that is corrupt, in this world that is full of iniquity. And so we live for him to bear fruit. If we are united with him, we shall bear fruit. We need not retain our sinful propensity. While echoing the words of the prophet Paul, the apostle, he said that uh, I'm crucified with Christ, yet not I that liveth, but Christ liveth in me. We need not to retain our sinful propensity. This clamoring and the appetites to be on the side of the evil one, these things we need not to retain them. We need to uh, have a hatred of sin until when we come into conduct with sin, our own bodies, not even our mind, will be repulsive against it. When our eyes behold sin, when our eyes behold the things that do not glorify God, our whole being from the mind and the flesh itself, from the things that hear and see, we will be able to have a hatred of sin as Christ even hated it. We find that when uh, Christ was um, tempted to sin and when he was offered the kingdoms of this world, instead of continuing to look at the things that Satan was offering, he moved his eyes away. He had a hatred of sin that he could not continue looking at sin. And Job says, I have covenanted with my eyes that I'll not behold, hear, or smell anything that is evil. The same thing the psalmist David says, I have made a covenant with my eyes that I will not behold evil. We have to come to this point that Christ has to be embedded in our system, in our life, so that uh, we may develop a, a, a repulsive of sin more than we have ever been. We have to compart with the evil powers and contend with the principalities that are fighting against the kingdom of God. And again, when we are brought in a crisis, when we are brought into great straits, we shall be like a Eno, who when he beheld sin and was brought into temptations and to sin and to behold Sodom and Gomorrah and other cities sinning, 
he preferred to die rather than continue living in sin. And this man was vexed with sin until God saw that if Enoch will continue to be in this world, then my servant will be sick of sin. We have to become sick of sin. And then we will be ready for translation. Such a hatred of sin does not come for a chance, but a close union with heaven. Heaven can never be gained but in perfect obedience, for this will place all heaven in jeopardy and make a possible second rebellion. And so those who will come up and be saved from the mark of the beast must reflect the image of Christ fully. There is no, there is nothing like a imperfect obedience. We have to be uh, perfectly united with uh, Jesus Christ. We have to uh, reflect the image of Jesus Christ fully. And uh, I'd like just to share this on the screen so that uh, we may see how we are going to go through the crisis then. In early writing, page 71, paragraph one, I also saw that many in order to live in the sight of the Lord without a high priest in the sanctuary through the time of trouble. Those who receive the seal of the living God and are protected in the time of trouble must reflect the image of Jesus fully. And now how do we actually possess this image fully? How do we come to the point that we really reflect Jesus Christ fully? I saw that many were neglecting the preparation so needful and were looking for the time of refreshing and the latter end to fit them to stand in the day of the Lord and to live in his sight. Many of us are procrastinating that uh, give me a little time, give me a little space. It doesn't matter right now. In the near future, I'll be ready. No, brothers and sisters, in the near future, you will not be ready. What you live today is what you will be tomorrow. We are told those who refuse to be healed by the prophets and fail to purify their souls in obeying the whole truth and who are willing to believe that their condition is far better than it really is will come up to the time of the falling of the plagues and then see they had need needed to be healed and squared for the building and how do we get to this point that uh, we have really surrendered fully to god it is by having his will, let this mind that was in Christ be in you. Philippians chapter two, verse five. Let us have the faith of Abraham when he was told move, he did not debate with God, which year am I moving? When he was told to go to the place he didn't know, he never asked God, how shall I eat at that point? We are told, but there will be no time then to do it and no mediator to plead their cause before, go, before the father. So before this time, the awful solemn declaration has gone forth. He that is unjust, let him be unjust. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. We should therefore be drawing nearer and nearer to the Lord and be earnestly seeking that preparation necessary to enable us to stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. Let all remember that God is holy and that none but holy beings can ever dwell in the presence of God. And so we are told that um, heaven can never be gained by an imperfect obedience for this would place all heaven in jeopardy and make a possible second rebellion. Now whom one nine, we are told that what you imagine against the Lord shall never rise again. Rebellion shall never rise again. And so imperfect people are not going to get to heaven, brothers and sisters. It is our time right now to make our act to remedy the defect of our characters. Jesus came to this world to save his people from their sins. He will not save us in our sins for he's not the minister of sin, signs of the time, February 15, 1892. But though we are carnal, we are to reckon ourselves dead and indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord, signs of the time, October 1, 1894. Every transgression brings the soul into condemnation and provokes the divine displeasure. Messages to the young people, page 429. No one who truly loves and fears God will continue to transgress the law in any particular. When man transgresses, he is under the condemnation of the law. It becomes to him a yoke of bondage. Whatever his profession may be, he is not justified. 
you see how justification runs until the saints get to heaven. And so whoever continues in transgression, it doesn't matter how he has lived in the past. He has lost justification. Justification is something that must be retained. How does it get retained? By continuing in the things, in obedience to the things that the Lord has instructed us. And so whatever his profession may be, he is not justified, which means pardon. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul through obedience, comes sanctification of body and soul and spirit. This sanctification is a progressive work and an advance from one stage of perfection to another. And so uh, our high point is to actually retain uh, sanctification in our life, retain justification in our lives. And uh, see how justification then is retained in our life. How is justification retained then in our lives? We are told, but while God can be just and yet justify the sinner through the merits of Christ, no man can cover his soul with the garments of Christ's righteousness while practicing non-sins or neglecting non-duties. Every time we neglect non-duties, we lose justification. God requires the entire surrender of the heart before justification can take place. And in order for man to retain justification, so justification is something that can be lost along the way if we do not continue in obedience. So there must be continual obedience through active living faith that works by love and purifies the soul. But yet many have come to a point they are so satisfied with their current status of life that they won't press forward to the mark that has been set before them. If Satan seeks to divert the mind to low and sensual things, bring it back again and place it on eternal things. And when the Lord sees, and when the Lord sees the determined effort made to retain only pure thoughts, he will attract the mind like the magnet, purify the thoughts and ennoble them to cleanse themselves from every secret sin, casting down imagination and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, 2 Corinthians 10, 5. The first work of those who reform is to purify the imagination. If the mind is laid out in a vicious direction, it must be a restrained to dwell only upon pure and elevated subjects. When tempted to yield to a corrupt imagination, then flee to the throne of grace and pray for strength from heaven. In the strength of God, the imagination can be disciplined to dwell upon things which are pure and uh, heavenly. And uh, while I was reading the Great Controversy, page 588, I found out something that it really amazed me, that uh, the object that Satan will employ in the last times to the kings and to the Christendom is intemperance. Yes, you heard it right. There are two things that Satan will employ in making sure that the saints and those who are worldlings fall. This is the clothing and number two, food. For the one of food and clothing, many people will be brought into great straits. So when we talk about uh, uh, the third angel's message, part of the third angel's message is actual can relieving. We are talking about obedience to the things that we know. We continue procrastinating these things and we say we shall be prepared at that time. When there's no buying and selling, there's no purchasing land, there's no preparing for anything. And so these things ought to be done prior to the time of crisis. And God willing, we have to do them before even the year ends. We have to implement these things because you people, you have watched the TV and listened to the radio. Now, the World Health Organization is saying that COVID is coming in the next phase as an airborne disease. It is being discovered that uh, it is, I don't know if this is mutation. I don't know if this is, uh, I don't know which word to use, but um, the World Health Organization is saying that COVID is coming in the second phase as an airborne disease. How do they know that it's coming as an airborne disease? 
first of all, they said that uh, COVID is caused when you come into contact with an animal which has the virus. Second, it went to COVID is a disease that is passed from one human being to another human being when they come into contact. The third phase, it was like uh, when you sit at a place where actually a person who has COVID, you get COVID. Now they are saying in the next phase, it is coming as an airborne disease. How do they know these things? How it seems like it's a story which is being cast on our, on our side. It is really something that we should be thinking that this world is being controlled by the devil himself and where we are headed, actually we need to rethink and to replan our lives and how we will live going forward. And uh, the, the, the US recently, I, I saw a post recently where actually a brother was saying that uh, the federal institution, uh, uh, the federal government is planning not to continue printing the dollars so that uh, we can live a cashless society. These are some of the rumors going around. And you, in Matthew 24, we are told that uh, you shall hear of the rumors of wars. You shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. You, you shall hear about these things. And so there is also a, a possibility that uh, if uh, COVID comes back with that intensity, the federal government is uh, putting in place um, uh, a, a measure that uh, the dollars should not be continued to be printed, but people have to go back to electronic transactions. Now you tell me how a person in the village who doesn't know anything about uh, 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 online transactions and uh, all this stuff that will be able to survive. This is like a measure to control everything that is going on. I don't know what is coming in the future, but the future doesn't look bright as we stand at this point. We have to get our act right. We don't have to work in fear. We have to work in love. We have to remedy every defect of our character so that Christ may not get us worried as the worldings are. The book of Luke chapter 21 says that uh, men's heart failing for fear of what is coming to happen in the world. We don't have to, and you see in this COVID crisis and all the crises that are happening, Men's heart failing, many people have really gotten high blood pressure, hypertension, and all this stuff that are related to heart diseases because they do not know what is coming to happen in this world. Seventh day Adventists need not to be in such a position of contracting heart diseases because of the fear of what is coming to happen in this world. But you will find even amongst us, there are people who are contracting heart diseases because of this. They can no longer imagine that this world is coming to an end with all the investments they have done. People have been educated to live in temporal prosperity until eternal things do not make sense to them. This is the generation that has to see Jesus Christ coming in the clouds of the air and we have to be prepared, brothers and sisters, for what is coming. And so the first work of those who reform is to purify imagination. Christ never sinned by thought or by word. And we are assured his victory is our victory. And as he overcame, also we have to overcome. We have to reach at a point we do not sin by thought or by word. And out of the abundance of the heart, so the heart speaketh, we are told uh, in the book of Matthew. And in the book of Proverbs, we, we are told that guard your heart. From the heart comes the issues of life. And so we have to guard our hearts. We have to guard what comes in so that whatever will come out will be pure. And if we do not actually uh, accept the seal of God to be at our foreheads, then it means that we will have impure thoughts and then the words that will proceed from our foreheads or from our frontal lobes will not be words that will please Jesus Christ. And so guard your hearts, brothers and sisters, from out of it comes issues of life. Your word have I hidden in my heart, Psalms 119 verse 11, that I may not sin against thee. We need to hide more than ever before the word of God in our hearts. If Satan sees he is in danger of losing one's soul, he will exert himself the uttermost to keep that one. And when the individual is aroused to his danger and with distress and fervor looks to Jesus for strength, Satan fears he shall lose a captive and he calls a reinforcement of his angels to hedge in the poor soul and form a wall of darkness around him that heaven's light may not reach him. But we are told 
that if there are prayers that Christ answers immediately, there are prayers, two prayers that Christ answers immediately is prayer to overcome sin and a prayer so that you may provide for a fellow brother something to eat, a garment or such a things. So these two prayers are actually the things that God will answer immediately. We do not need to doubt if God will answer our prayers on the issue of overcoming sin. When we are tempted and assailed by the tempter, we have to lift up our voices unto the Lord and fall at the feet of Jesus Christ and tell him that this in human strength I cannot. Give me your strength so that I may be able to overcome. Such a temptation, such a, a prayer, heaven answers immediately. And a prayer that my neighbor needs something, oh Lord, and if they don't get this thing, their life is in jeopardy. Such a prayer also God answers directly. Other things God may say, wait and be patient, but such a two prayers, the Lord will answer them. So when we are assailed by the devil to sin, we need just to cry to the Lord. Remember Peter when he was singing, he cried, Lord, save me. And immediately the Lord was able to save him. The Lord will not wait for you to be in sin so as to be saved. He will answer your prayers immediately. But if the one in danger perseveres and in helplessness and weakness casts himself upon the merits of the blood of Christ. Jesus listened to the earnest prayer of faith and sends a reinforcement of those angels which excel in strength to deliver him. Messages to the young people, page 53. Satan cannot endure to have his powerful rival appeal to, for he fears and trembles before him, his strength, Christ's strength and majesty. At the sound of fervent prayer, Satan's whole host trembles. And when angels all powerful clothed with the armor of heaven came to the help of the fainting, pursued soul, Satan and his host fall back, well knowing that their battle is lost. Remember uh, the servant of the Lord, Elisha, when he was brought into great straits that would have led him to doubt the providence of God. He prayed for the servant Gehazi, and he said, Lord, open the eyes of Gehazi so that he may see the host of heaven who are for us. And when the Assyrian army came down to take him, he prayed, and then the Lord was able to blind the whole force of the Assyrian army. And then the angel directed them in the city where actually Elisha was able to feed them and tell them, go back to where you come from. You are looking for a man who has no problem with you. That is how Christ works in our lives when we have sin. When we actually make that fervent prayer, Lord, I'm sinking. I need your power to be manifested in this place. That is what Christ does. He sends his whole army to be able to minister unto the saints. And the prayer should be a prayer of faith, not a presumptuous prayer. We cannot pray and at the same time sinning. Sinning and praying, praying and sinning, this is an abomination to God. God does not listen to the prayers of the wicked. We, if we espouse sin and rejoice in sin and then think when we are brought to some temptation, God will just send his angels for our sake. Brothers and sisters, we are deceiving ourselves. We must live according to every truth we have received. And then when we are brought into these great straits, the Lord will be able to send his angels to uh, fight for us. So summary, as one with us, a sharer in our needs and weaknesses, he was wholly dependent upon God. This is justification by faith. And in the secret place of prayer, he sought divine strength that he might go forth braced for duty and trial. I want to speak something here just in two minutes. People have neglected prayers. And uh, I'm sorry, brothers and sisters, if you think that you can make impromptu prayers just only when you need God, God is not uh, a switch on your wall. God is not a remote control where actually you press the button of uh, SOS and then when things are going better, you are calm, never minding about him. 
God is a jealous God. You cannot preoccupy yourself 90% of your life with worldly things. And then in, in the cry of distress, you call on the name of Jesus. There are many people who are called Jesus. And maybe you may be calling one of them in your prayers. There is one Jesus who saved and we have to have a living connection with him. Neglect prayer at your own peril. Then you will pray and seek him according to Isaiah 55 and you will never find him. Seek the Lord while he may be found, Isaiah 55 says. But some of us have turned Jesus into a remote control and have turned him into an electricity switch where actually when you need him, you just press the switch. When you need him, you press the button on your remote. That is not going to work. Let us call to Jesus Christ himself who was God, the son of the living God. He prayed, he spent a whole night praying to the father. When we go on our knees one minute and we are tired, And even forget the one can live for a second or a minute without a prayer. And so we have uh, been accustomed to electronics until we think that uh, the, the father and the son are also such electronics that can be switched on and off whenever we want. I say we ought to repent about our prayer life and uh, rethink about it. When the individual is aroused to his danger and with distress and favor looks to Jesus for strength, certain fears he shall lose a captive. If the one in danger perseveres and is helpless and weakness casts himself upon the merits of the blood of Christ, Jesus listened to the earnest prayer of faith. And when angels, all powerful, clothed with the armor of heaven, host fall back. What happens if I should sleep and fall? You are an, a Christian pursuing the Lord Jesus Christ with you all your heart. Is there a possibility sometimes? that uh, unaware you can be brought into a failure. We are told that uh, it was through self-sufficiency that Peter fell and it was through repentance and humiliation that his feet were again uh, uh, established. In the record of his experience, every repenting sinner may find encouragement. Brother Brian made a statement which should continue to sound in our ears. God is not a tyrant or a rebel leading a country just waiting for the subject to make a slight a bad move and then they are punished. That is not the God we serve. There is an extreme that God is so displeased with us that at any move he is ready to punish. And there is another extreme that God loves us so much that he doesn't care if we do something bad. Such extremities are not necessary. God is a loving God and he knows our frailties, but Christ is our example. We can live a sinless life. But first John chapter two verse one says that, but if anyone makes that point of sleeping, we have an advocate before the father. A righteous man may fall seven times. So the book of Psalms say, but he will rise never to sin again. We have to come to a point, if we sleep, we will never repeat the sin again. We can be brought into a place, we give examples where actually you, you are working in an office and you are brought a document to sign and you didn't know that this thing, actually the end result of it will be like this and this. And then you end up being a participant in a sin of omission you have slipped and fell into sin because you are not vigilant enough to ask of the Lord, this document that I'm signing, what is it is end result? Sometimes a brother can lead you into doing something and the result of it, you find that somebody has been injured or something has happened. You have been led into sin. And when you realize that you have been led into sin, we have a father who is waiting for us to acknowledge that we really didn't seek him with all our heart and we are sorry, we repent of it. And the father will give us that victory and we shall never repeat something of that kind. The reason why we even enter into the sins of omission is because we are not prayerful enough. 
But if we were prayerful enough, like Jesus Christ was, then we will not be entering into sin. We shall reach at a point we will not sin because we are connected with heaven and heaven will be able to tell us if we are going in the wrong step or the right step. And so though Peter had grievously sinned, he was not forsaken. The words of Christ were written upon his soul, I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And remember what Peter did? He denied Jesus Christ. He said, before denying Jesus Christ, he told him, I'll go with you through all the crisis. And then Jesus looks at him lovingly and tells him, Peter, before the cock cross, you will deny me three times. But I have prayed for you that when you are converted, you may strengthen your brethren. Peter never knew that he was going to sin, but Christ knew he was going to sin. And so when he was brought into this crisis and he repented bitterly with sorrows and with tears when the cock uh, 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 the, uh, crew, then he was able to be forgiven. And so in this bitter agony of remorse, this prayer and the memory of Christ's look of love and pity gave him hope. Christ, after his resurrection, remembered Peter and gave the angel the message for the woman. Go your way, tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth forth uh, before you into Galilee. There shall, there shall you see him. Mark 16, verse 7. And so the same compassion that reached out to rescue Peter is extended to every soul who has fallen under temptation. Are you despairing in your life that you have been fighting with this and that for a long time? And you don't see a way through? Your eyes should stop beholding yourself and should start beholding Jesus Christ. It was to lead man into sin and then leave him helpless and trembling, fearing to seek for pardon. But why should we fear when God has said, let him take hold of my strength that he may make peace with me and he shall make peace with me, Isaiah 27, 5. Every provision has been made for our infirmities, every encouragement offered to us to come to Christ. In the book of Hebrews chapter 14, chapter four, verse 15, he says that come boldly before the throne of grace in time of need and he will give you the supply of his mercies. He will give you the help that you need. We don't have to come before the Lord. We have a high priest, an advocate, Jesus Christ, who is with the Father. He was afflicted and he went through the temptation that man goes through, but without sin. And he is able to succor all of them that comes to him. Christ offered up his broken body to purchase back God's heritage, to give man another trial. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing his ever liveth to make intercession. Hebrews 7, 25. 1 John 2, 1, my little children, these things I write I unto you that you sin not. So there is a possibility of not sinning. But, and if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And so we are looking at that period where chains are to be broken, our hope and our encouragement. When is this time? The time is now. Satan is constantly at work. But few have any idea of his activity and subtlety. The people of God must be prepared to withstand the will of for. It is this resistance that Satan breeds. He knows better than we do the limit of his power and has easily he can be overcome if we resist and face him. So Satan can easily be defeated because he does not force anyone to commit sin. Through divine strength, the weakest sin is more than a match for him and all his angels. And if brought to the test, he will be able to prove his superior power. Amen. Therefore, Satan's step is noiseless, his movement stiffly, and his butt, butter is masked. He does not venture to show himself open lest he arouse the Christian's dormant energies and send him to God in prayer. You see how saints can overcome to be vigilant in prayer. Pray without ceasing. And so James 4, 7, submit yourself therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. If there is, a, if we want to make a great stride in our life, if we want to make a great leap of faith in our life, 
family altars should never be something that should be neglected. Whichever the case in our families, whether with friends, whether with whom we are, altars in our house are paramount to be there. We should pray, we should unite together. The most dangerous tempters are the people that we live in. And if we can subdue them with prayer, then we will even induce them to be on the side of God. But you pray less and you expect to overcome your wife, you expect to overcome your husband, you expect to overcome your children. Brothers and sisters, only what they will do is provoke you to anger and anger really reigns in the bosom of fools according to Ecclesiastes. The children of God have not to react in anger. They have to be calm and self-possessed. Then they can be able to resonate with the problem they are having and make informed decision that will even make the evil people wonder what kind of power is working in them. This is, should be our duty to pray without ceasing and to continue in these family altars, something that is so important. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as in common to man, but God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Second Peter 2, the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. The Savior took upon himself the infirmities of humanity and lived a sinless life that men might have no fear that because of the weakness of human nature, they could not overcome. Christ came to make us partakers of the divine nature and his life declares that humanity combined with divinity does not commit sin. Remember 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. Unto us has been given exceeding precious promises that we may be partakers of divine nature after ex escaping the corruptions that are in this world. What a marvelous promise. What a marvelous arrangement that God has made in the plan of redemption that human beings who are prone to human weakness at last may be partakers of the divine nature and in the end, be like angels. Remember what Isaiah says, that those who wait upon the Lord, they shall soar on wings like eagles. Even though the youth may walk, they will not be faint. Although they run, they will not be weary. We shall be like angels, but only those who wait on the Lord. It needs the patience of the saints to be able to go through this crisis for our characters to be formed fully to God. We have to be patient enough to wait on the Lord and not do our own things. The last seven slides. He bore my souls, disgrace that in his name I might be uh, an overcomer and be exalted to his throne. Tell of his power, sing of his matchless love. In every trial he will be near you and will give you grace and power according to your need, review and herald, July 19, 1892. In the signs of the time, Christ came to our world to show us how to live true upright lives and all who are Christians will carry out his principles. We can overcome, yes, fully entirely. Jesus died to make a way of escape for us that we might overcome every fault resist every temptation and sit down at last with him in his throne. Everyone who by faith obeys God's commandments will reach the condition of sinlessness in which Adam lived before his transgression. Amen. Many people do not believe we can reach to the real stature and measure of the man Jesus Christ and be sinless. Yes, brothers and sisters, we can reach this condition before probation closes. It has been assured his victory is our victory. When he cried out, it is finished on Calvary. It was not just an end to the sacrificial system, but he was uh, 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 putting forth a statement that really reveals unto us the powers of the devil had been broken by the blood of Jesus Christ, which was shed on Calvary. And by that blood, we can also overcome. 
He who has not sufficient faith in Christ to believe that he can keep him from sinning has not the faith that will give him an entrance into the kingdom of God. So if we don't believe that we can have victory over sin, then there is no stepping in the kingdom of God. Jesus knows the circumstances of every soul. The greater the sinner's guilt, the more he needs the Savior. His heart of divine love and sympathy is drawn out most of all to the one who is the most hopelessly entangled in the snares of the enemy. With his own blood, he has signed the emancipation papers of the race. I don't know if you find this statement so interesting and so captivating that they permeate the whole being of your existence, that Christ has signed emancipation papers. Those who work in the courts understand. Those who watch these TVs where actually people discuss law, they can understand what is emancipation papers. But even a person who has never uh, uh, read about these things can be able to understand. When a signature is put on a paper, that thing is sealed. It is complete. And Christ is same yesterday, today, and forever. He cannot put a seal on the paper that you are forgiven and you are his child and then retract. It is only you now to choose that that paper has nothing to do with me. But Christ himself has signed that paper with his own blood. For without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin in the book of Hebrews. But now the paper has not been signed by an ink, but it has been signed by the blood. And it says, this is my child. This is my son. This is my daughter. He is part of my kingdom. When Christ died on Calvary, he reversed what Satan had did in the book of Genesis chapter 3. And everyone now was vicariously justified before God. And this is why this world has been in existence for all these years, because the emancipation papers have been signed. The problem is that the people will not accept those papers to be valid. And this is where the problem is. But Christ has never, for, have never given up on us. He says that I signed those papers. Take them. This is your ticket to the kingdom, my blood. But many would want to enter on their own account and even others will not want to enter. They want to form a kingdom of their own, a satanic kingdom. And so, Jesus does not desire those who have been purchased at such a cost to become the sport of enemy's temptation. He does not desire us to be overcome and perish. He who curbed the lions in their den and walked with his faithful witnesses amid the fiery flame is just as ready to work in our behalf to subdue every evil in our nature. Today, he is standing at the altar of mercy, presenting before God the prayers of those who desire his help. He turns no weeping contrite one away. Freely will he pardon all who come to him for forgiveness and restoration. He does not tell to any all that he might reveal, but he bids every trembling soul take courage. Whosoever will may hold of God's strength and make peace with him, and he will make, uh, uh, make peace, and he will make peace. Lastly, in the justification by faith. We have a journey of justification by faith. We have seen all the history that has been there. We have seen how Satan plans his strategies. And we have seen how many in this world uh, perverse this doctrine. But now we read at last, the humanity of the Son of God is everything to us. In this is hidden the secret of victory over sin. It is the golden chain that binds our souls to Christ and through Christ to God. This is to be our study. Christ was a real man. He gave proof of his humility in becoming a man. Yet he was God in the flesh. When we approach this subject, we will do well to heal the word spoken by Christ to Moses at the burning bush. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, 
for the place we are on, on where on the standard is holy ground. We will come to this study with the humility of a learner with a contrite heart. And the study of the incarnation of Christ is a fruitful field which will repay the searcher with who digs deep for hidden treasure. May the Lord of heaven bless us. May he encourage us. May we not lean on the arm of flesh. Psalms, the midst verse in the Bible, Psalms 119, 118, that uh, cast is a man who leans on the arm of flesh. And uh, we will better do to lean on the arm of Jesus Christ and not lean on the arm of the flesh. We will better actually lean on the arm of Jesus Christ and not on the arm of flesh. Sorry, the midst verse is uh, Psalms 118 verse Eight. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man, not Psalms 119, but Psalms 118 verse 8, which is the midst verse in the whole Bible. Verse 9 says, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in the princes. Some of the people in this world have put their confidence in their treasures, in their friends, in their children, in their wives and husbands, but this is not going to save us. Only the blood of Christ is going to save us. May the Lord be with us. And uh, may he, uh, thank you, Brother Janus Irungu. Also, Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 5 says that cast is a man, uh, uh, a person who leans uh, on another man. And so uh, I pray that uh, the Lord of heaven may be with us. He may continue guiding us. And in everything, let us cast all our cares unto Christ because he cares. Let us pray. Abba Father in heaven, thank you so much for the journey that we have traveled. We pray that uh, you continue being with us. You may continue impressing these things on our minds. At the end of the day, we may live for thee and not for self. For all uh, selfishness is sin. We pray that uh, you may be with our families. Wherever we have been weak, you may strengthen us. And above all, Lord, you may reach unto others. The love of God may constrain us not to remain the same, but your words may burn in our hearts that we may reach in those who are in darkness. But Lord, we cannot go to those in darkness if we are ourselves in darkness. First of all, open our eyes as laudations, Lord clothe us with that raiment that does not get old and give us that gold that is pure. We need thee every hour. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen.